probably prevent you from walking around and falling off the stage. I remember uh, one of my one of my early one of my earlier conversations with with Linda as she would I remember used to always say, Man, Pastor, I think you're gonna fall off the stage when you get all close to the edge. Um, but I like to walk around. So I, I'm just pre I'm pretending in my mind we're in my living room this morning. We just get to chat a little bit. I have been encouraged. I've been encouraged about what God is doing in our church body. Uh, it's been a blessing. Uh, Rachel and I, look, uh, Rachel's a little bit more of a calendar person than I am, uh, and she's like, hey, next Sunday will be six months since we've become the lead pastor yeah. at, at Cat City Church. Yeah. And, uh, Thank you. and it's so, it's so awesome. <laughs> Uh, so next week, uh, next week is going to be a good, a good gathering as well. I think every time we gather is awesome. I feel bad. So like uh, when I'm preaching, one thing I do is I walk and I can look at everybody. And so I have to turn here and miss Mary. And, uh, but anyway, I'll have to survey a little bit. All right. But uh, next week is going to be an awesome time. We have our state superintendent coming. His name is John Davis. And so... Uh, Cap City Church is an Assembly of God uh, church, and there are over, I believe, over 150 Assembly of God churches in Wisconsin. And so John Javis oversees all of them. He helps give a direction and guidance and, and, and spiritual oversight. And so I invited him to come. I didn't even know that next week that it lined up with the six-month kind of thing, but, it, but it's neat that we get to have John come and speak. And I'm encouraged. He has a pastor's heart. He loves the presence of God. He loves to pray. And so I'm believing that next week will be another time that we just get to receive from the Lord. So if you uh, if you have been here for the last few weeks, you know, or maybe the last few months, we've been going through Matthew chapter 5. And we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And as I as I've looked at the, the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount over and over and over again, I find myself challenged. Uh, it challenged me the, the deepest part of who I am, and, and last week was no different. We looked at Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 through 30, and, and in this passage, uh, Jesus says that you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks that a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he goes on to instruct us, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Uh, it is better for you to lose one of your members and your whole body be thrown into hell. And in verse 30 it says, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. And I confessed last week, and again, as I was reflecting on this passage, uh, it's a, I thought it was a heavy, a heavy topic to tackle. And, and, and as I looked at the Sermon on the Mount ahead of time, I said, wow, these are, these are some real topics, some in your living room, in your face kind of topics. But I love the way that Jesus addresses this issue because the religious leaders of the day were able to say without a doubt, hey, I've never committed adultery. I've never touched that woman. Oh, I've never gone to that extent with somebody. And Jesus begins uh, throughout the whole sermon, but specifically in that passage, to address the issue of the heart. That it's not just the physical things. Maybe many of us in this room can say the same thing like the religious leaders of that day. Oh, I've, I've never gone that far, or oh, I've never done that thing. But Jesus says, look at the heart, and the, uh, and the heart is what matters. And he says that if we look with lustful intent, if we've examined, if we've told them with our desires, and we look a little bit at the fact that, God, that we have been given God-given desires, we've been given desires for sexuality, and, and that these things are good when they, when, they are, um, when they are done and used in the confines that God has designed them for. <laughs> And in the following part of the scripture, though, I, I thought last week, you know, um, I didn't bring any eye picks or, or meat cleavers to cut off any hands or pick out any eyes. And so we examined what Jesus was getting at, because I, I proposed that because Jesus said it was a heart issue and it wasn't a physical issue, that, that the words that he spoke of, cutting things off of our bodies, was also a heart issue or a spiritual issue. And we found that 
the sword of the Spirit, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, it says, By the Spirit we should put to death the things of the flesh. And so we looked and found that the, the Spirit of God it, it represents the sword of the Spirit, and it's by His Word that we're able to cut and receive from Him and remove these unhealthy desires from our hearts. And as I finished the conversation of the message last week, I... I thought to myself that there's so much more to unpack on this subject, especially of desires, the desires that we've been given, and, and the way that, it, that oftentimes the enemy will use a God-given desire and will thwart it or he'll, uh, he'll, he'll pervert it in, in a way that leads us to sin instead of its intended target. God has given us desires of our heart, deep-rooted desires of our heart, for good, and that is to find Him and to find satisfaction in Him. But we'll see today that even from the beginning, uh, the enemy has tried to use created things to, uh, for us to meet our desires through created things rather than our Creator. And so today, we're going to move from Matthew chapter 5 today and go to Isaiah. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 55 this morning. And last week I, I, I had mentioned that our, our desires, they, they will often lead us when we, when we choose to meet our desires outside of the will of God and the, the design that He has for our life, it will often lead us to a mirage which will only leave us more thirsty. And I, I couldn't help but think about a, a few other questions and asking myself, why, why do we act as if we have so little? As believers, why, why is it that we act as if we have so little? Why is it that satisfaction seems to be so elusive? Continue thinking about these questions. Why do we struggle to be content? And I believe the answer is that when we have found, uh, when our desires have led us away from who God is, we find that we can never be satisfied. So let's look here at Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to look at verses 1 through 7 this morning, and I believe there's going to be some truth that will encourage us on our way as we look to find our God-given desires met by Him and not from outside or created things. So let's read Isaiah 55, verse 1 through 7 this morning. It says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the water, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, or labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Let the, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I love that last verse, and I try not to get ahead of myself when I plan out what I'm going to speak. But when I think about that, last verse, and especially as we've been contemplating these desires and how our desires, and last week we took some time to confess to the Lord the way that our desires have been corrupted and they've led us away from God. Uh, the beautiful thing about the Father, and this is a truth that I hope that we get inside of us, 
But the beautiful thing about the Father is He is always inviting us to come near. He always wants us to be whole. He, he always wants restoration for us. And so last week, God, I spoke it this way. I said, if we hear the Holy Spirit's conviction this morning, my prayer is that with joy we'll receive the Holy Spirit's conviction. What does that mean? If we find that the Holy Spirit is pointing something out in our hearts that, that isn't like God, that isn't holy, that doesn't, that doesn't look like we've been satisfied with God, if that happens this morning, with joy receive it. Because know this, that when, the, when you hear the Holy Spirit's voice, God desires to restore that. He desires to make that new in your life. He desires to bring you hope to that area. So the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when, when God points out something that is not right in our life, it's never a bad thing. It should be received with joy. There's another voice that we can hear that's the voice of condemnation, but that's the voice of the enemy. The enemy loves to kill and to destroy. He loves to bring shame. He loves to, to, to convince us that, that we're no good, that, that, we're, that, that we should receive punishment, that, that we, that we um, are, are not able to overcome where we are at. But the voice of the Lord always brings restoration. So again, as I read this passage in Isaiah, I heard that same inviting voice of the Father. That same voice that says, no matter where you're at, no matter what your, where your desires have led you today, no matter where you find yourself, the same invitation is to us this morning. And that invitation ends in verse 7, says that he will abundantly pardon us. That he will abundantly extend his forgiveness to us. Verse 1 this morning. Everyone who is hungry and thirsty can come. I liked it when I read it uh, again this morning, in this moment, again bringing this to my attention, that in verse 1 it says, He who has no money can buy and eat. Without money, without price. This morning we, we spoke about the fact that Jesus, it was saying about the fact that Jesus has overcome, that, that he has victory for this morning. Jesus paid the price for all. And so no matter where you find yourself this morning, no matter what your background is, I'll repeat this over and over again, Jesus invites us, the Father invites us to come, and it's without price. He has bread for us. He has the exact things that is meant for us. To satisfy. So in this passage, God put our spiritual hunger and thirst for every human being. It should lead to Him, to Jesus. Everyone seeks hope. I mean, like I, I can't think of an individual that I know, and no matter what their background is, that isn't seeking hope, that isn't seeking fulfillment or purpose or meaning. I used to work with college students, and that was something I would see all the time. You know, they were, they were seeking, they were searching after, what is my fulfillment, what is my purpose in life? But even as I work as a, as a lead pastor, I see the same thing going on inside of us, this desires for fulfillment, this desires for hope, this desires for security and, and for affection and, and for affirmation. And these things, I, I want to say boldly today, they will continue to go on as a void inside of you until you are willing with all of your heart to say, Lord, come and satisfy me. Until we are able to say, God, I come to you, I receive from you, it will continue to be an issue of voidance in our hearts. Desires, I believe, uh, fulfillment and all these things, they're a good thing, they're a grace, they're from God, but they're also a danger. They're a grace from God because God knows He, he designed us and he, he gave us the longings of our heart knowing that He was the one that satisfies us. 
In Romans, we'll look at this in a moment, but in Romans it says that, that we have traded uh, worship and we, we've traded honor of God for created things rather, rather than the Creator. That is the danger in our desires. The danger is that, that our desires can become twisted, and, and like last week I said, they, beca they can become self-satisfying to where we desire things for ourselves. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, this is what it says. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, it says that they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Remember last week, we, we looked and examined at the fact that that, um, that sin is deceitful. It, it, it blinds us to what God has designed and what God wills for our life. And, and what is the solution? That's why I said the sword of the Spirit is the solution to cut out the lust in our hearts. Because the solution is truth. Whenever you meet somebody, whenever you know a close uh, a friend or a family member who is deceived, they're going wrong, along the wrong path, what, what do you do? You, you bring up facts to them. You bring a study to them. You, you try to bring truth to them. Well, Jesus, the, the Word of God, it is the truth. And so we find that our, the danger in our desires is that we'll exchange the truth of God, we'll, we'll exchange what God designs to satisfy us with for a lie. We worship, it goes on to say, we worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. What happens when we go down this path, exchanging what God designed for us for the things that are self-desires? And in verse 28, it says this, as you continue on in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, it says this, they were filled with all manners of unrighteousness. If you read through this passage, and I encourage you to do so, read through Romans 1. It, it talks about how that their, their sins, the way that they've gone after created things rather than the Creator, all of a sudden their, their, their sin becomes twisted, and, and it even becomes unnatural. It, it, goes, it, it kind of goes in order. It says, hey, at first we, we start getting angry, and we, we, we start uh, thinking murderous thoughts, and then it goes into twisted behavior and, and, and perverted behaviors. And, and, and that's what our sin, our desires, unmet by the Father, will lead us to places that we never desire to go. And last week and this week, I'll repeat that. If you find yourself in a place that you never intended to be, the opportunity again today, just as Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1 says, to come. Come to the Father. He's inviting you to be satisfied by himself. The point I would want to make is that creation never satisfies. I love this in verse 2. It begins to describe it this way. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy. A lot of the Holy Spirit just to repeat that question in your heart this morning. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread or labor for that which does not satisfy? Then it goes on to say, listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. There's a contrast here for those who learn to satisfy the soul and those who do not. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, it, it brings it up this way. It says that you turned away from me. This is God speaking to his people in, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. He says, You've turned away from me the living spring of water, and they have dug their own wells, which are broken wells, and they cannot hold water. Why? 
when our desire, when we choose to allow our desires to be met by something that doesn't line up with who God is and what He's done, it will always leave us empty, thirsting for more, never being satisfied. I have to receive it again. Last week we talked about sexual desires and the and the myth of pornography that that, that uh, and, and lust and all of those different desires that when we go and we think that those things are going to satisfy our desires we find at the end of it that it doesn't and it causes us to go back and back and over again going to the same well that never brought satisfaction to begin with. This morning, I wanted to look at. I, I was thinking about about. Uh, I was thinking about seven different desires that we have, and I would think that there's many more desires that, that may come up in our heart. But but I wanted to examine uh, and show uh, first step in this morning that, that desires that are given to us by God, and we'll see later how God satisfies these desires. But if we have, if we allow these desires to be unmet by the truth of who God is, they will lead us away from Him. So let me let us look together at these. So the first one that I, as I thought about it, and, and now as a, a, a newer father, I get to see in my son all the time, but it, it is a desire for attention. A desire for attention, a desire, this desire, it looks like a, a longing for people to like me. That's actually a, a healthy thing. As we, as we talk with different therapists, it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing that we desire to be liked. It's a, it's a, it's a healthy thing to desire attention, but... When we find that this desire for attention is not met by the Father in heaven, we're going to get to how He meets us. Uh, it will lead us to going places that we never intended to go. I desire someone to like me, and it will lead me to behavior. It will lead me to do things outside of the will of God for our life because I'm desiring the approval of others, the attention of other people. Uh, the second uh, desire that I found uh, common to many is, is a desire for affection. I mean, I don't know about you, I, I long to be enjoyed. I long that others would take pleasure in me, that they would enjoy me, that I, uh, that I can receive from them affection. And this is one area I see in in the area of relationships that the enemy uses so often to uh, to bring about a creation rather than the creator. We so long to have the affection, we so long to be enjoyed that we go after relationship, relationship with others, whether it be a romantic relationship or even in friendships, where we go after the enjoyment of others, that others would take pleasure in, in me. Third desire that I see often as I interact with others is a desire for affirmation. A longing to be known. Can't wait to release that book to be known. I can't wait to uh, say the next best uh, thing on Facebook or Twitter or, or Instagram. I, I, I long to be known, to, next, to have the next best hit, to, to work harder, to show that I am better than everyone else. I, I have what it takes. I long for approval. A desire for affirmation. Fourth desire I see common in, in life is a as a desire for acceptance. I long to belong. I, I want to be in the in crowd. I, I want to be where the action is. I, 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 I want to be loved. I want to, everybody to enjoy me. I, I long for acceptance. Fifth one, I, I, I see common place that the enemy can use 
to twist and, and to take place of who God is it, is a long for satisfaction. Uh, I, I know many people have come to me who have spoken of a, a desire to work and, and, and are working themselves to death, a, a long for fulfillment. I, I gotta fulfill myself, and the only way that I know to fulfill myself is when I accomplish something, so I wanna accomplish more, to have more fulfillment, to be more satisfied. I long for well-being. I have to establish myself in, in order that uh, I'll be satisfied in my old age. I gotta work toward that. I gotta go after it. Another desire is a desire for significance. I, I long to have impact on others. I, I long to be meaningful. I long to be powerful. Oftentimes, when significance takes a hold of our heart in an ungodly way, we will find ourselves going after power, going after the next accomplishment, trying to use other people in order to gain significance. The last one I, I picked, and, and I would say again, I, I think this list could be it's off of it. We continue to go after these desires. I would pick these seven because I felt that they were most significant to, to the most broad uh, group this morning, but that uh, we have a desire for security. I long to know it's okay. This is one that, that creates, when, when met un, in ungodly ways, creates the most anxiety inside of us. I, I long to know it's okay. I, I long to know things are secure. I, I long to know my future is okay. I, I long to know that tomorrow will be okay. I, I long to make sure that everything is, is in order. Security. What we find here is that creation and all the ways that we go to try to satisfy these desires outside of who God is, they will never satisfy the soul. They will never meet that deepest desire, no matter how good it sounds to our mind. Meeting these needs and these desires outside of who God is and what He's done will, will always lead us longing for more. If you're convinced that your, your search or your uh, the satisfaction that, that you are finding uh, for those desires are yours, I, I would pray that you have not found it outside of who God is. I want to encourage you to do this helpful diagnosis. You think, all right, Andrew, uh, maybe there was one of those steps. You said, oh, I can see exactly a desire in the way that I've tried outside of God to meet those. But, but I want to encourage you to, to ask, this self, and ask this question to yourself. Uh, if I only had blank, you can fill in that blank of whatever it would be. I don't know, as, as good Christians uh, in the room, right, we would say, oh, Jesus, right? If I only had Jesus, you know, I, I would be happy. But I want, I, I want to encourage you. Sometimes honesty with yourself is the hardest thing because then it reveals to you who you really are. And sometimes when I see myself or who I really am, it doesn't always look very pretty, right? But to ask yourself, if I only had this, what would make me happy? And I, 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 I believe that if, if a created thing, if something I could work towards, if a created thing it is what occupies that blank space, I believe there, there's room for you to come to the Father because he, he wants to give you something better. Something that will satisfy you deep inside so that your working ceases, so that your searching stops, so that your thirsting ceases. Because I believe this, that only Jesus satisfies. Only Jesus satisfies. Let's look again, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 3 through 5 this morning. In Scripture, there is many different uh, genres of writing. Uh, you may be familiar with them. Some of them in history, some of them are 
poetry, some of them are prophetic, some of them are accounts, and, and, and Isaiah is one of the books of prophecy, and, and so prophecy is usually a, a foretelling of something to come, it's a word that's given directly from God himself, and so in these next uh, three verses, verse 3 through 5, we, we see a prophecy, where it's a prophecy given, and it's about Jesus himself, so let's read with that lens this morning, these verses Verse 3 through 5, it says, Incline your ear and come to me. Man, if, if you haven't already, oh, that invitation is, hear that invitation. It's all over the scripture. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. My steadfast, sure love for David. This is pointing uh, to Jesus himself. It says uh, in the Old Testament that there, there is going to be a covenant established with David. That his kingdom, his throne would endure forever. Jesus is the seed uh, of David. He, he, he is in the lineage of David. And so Jesus establishing his throne, or like we sang this morning, overcoming death. And establishing victory, Jesus establishes his throne forever. And this is what it begins to speak of in this verse 3. Verse 4, it says this, Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Who has he glorified? Who has he lifted up? Who do the nations get the same invitation that every individual received? They get an invitation to come to Jesus. Man, this is so good. I mean, I would want to say so much more. Uh, that, that throughout all of Scripture, the invitation is for all people, every tongue, tribe, and nation. This is not just a New Testament, Paul going and preaching to, to every, every person. This is from the very beginning, even in the Old Testament scripture here in Isaiah, that all nations, all people groups, every individual was to come and to receive from Jesus, to be blessed by Him. Only Jesus satisfies. Sometimes we think, and we have heard in our lives, and when we think about this, only Jesus satisfies, we think about churchy things. Think about our, our Sunday morning uh, attendance, or we think about our, our Bible studies or our missional community uh, at times that, that yes, if I, if I come to these things, Jesus will satisfy me. I would say these things are really good. These regular rhythms of our lives of meeting together are, are great things and they benefit us and we receive so much from them. But I would propose to you that, that it's not from those ah, groupings, those meetings that we receive satisfaction. What Isaiah is speaking to us is that it is from Jesus himself. Well, enter all those things that are about Jesus. Yes. But I, I, I want to encourage you that in those things, don't become a work. Don't become, again, another effort, another way in which we're trying to meet our desires. No, Jesus invites us to him himself and that he himself will satisfy us. So if you're not... If you're coming to church on Sunday morning because it's a good thing to do, I want to encourage you, don't come because it's a good thing to do. Don't read your Bible because it's a good thing to do. Don't go to missional community because it's a good thing to do. Do all these things in such a way, in such a condition of your heart that you're doing them to Jesus and Jesus alone. You come on Sunday morning not to worship because Amy has an amazing voice. You come to, to, to worship on Sunday morning because Jesus deserves all the praise and, and I want to show him my affections for him. I come and I listen to the word of God that, that gets spoken every Sunday morning not because I may or may not be a good oracle or a good, a good speaker. Come because you want to meet with Jesus. 
Because the words that are shared on Sunday morning are not just human words, they're not just words on a page, they're the words of Jesus himself, and he longs to, to feed you the bread that will satisfy you. When you worship and you play songs during the week, don't just do it because you want to play some good music instead of some music that is maybe filled full of filth. Play it and worship to the music because you are receiving from Jesus himself and you're able to meet with him. Come to encounter, not because it's another thing we're doing as in church. Do it because we truly have an opportunity to meet with Jesus, to hear from him and receive from his words. Only Jesus satisfies him. John chapter 4 it's a beautiful, is a beautiful story where Jesus is with his disciples and his disciples are hungry. I like that. It, I, I like reading some of the, the New Testament stories because it, it um, I want to turn here first so I can. I like reading the New Testament stories and, and some of the details that are put into them because they, they make the disciples seem human. I can identify with them a little bit more. But Jesus, his disciples go and they, they receive, uh, they go to get food. And Jesus is, is sitting by the well and, and there's a woman that, that comes to the well. And, 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 if, and if there's any picture that in, in, in the Bible that really fully shows somebody who has desires in their heart and are, and are going outside of God to, to meet those desires, I think this, this picture with this woman at the well and Jesus, it, it really exemplifies that, where, where she is one that, that unable to be satisfied. And Jesus speaks prophecy, he speaks about her, and, and, and speaks that she has many husbands, she's, she's searching for satisfaction in that way, and, and has yet to find it. And Jesus, now in verse 13, he, he says this, and they're, they're talking about physical water here in a moment. They're at a well and, and talking. But, but Jesus brings this, this truth statement here in, in verse 13. And he says this. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. He's talking about the, the natural well there. He's also talking about the sin that she found herself in. Going to it over and over again and, and not being able to be satisfied. Whoever drinks from that, they'll, never, they'll, they'll be thirsty again. But, verse 14, whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Jesus offers us water that will satisfy. If I'm, if I'm going down these uh, these list of desires that I that I said earlier, the desire for attention. Wow! If I think about who God is, and, and it reveals this in Scripture, Psalms eight verse four, it says this: "That who is man that you are mindful of them?" Or, or Luke. 12 verse 7 says that, that God knows the number of hairs on our head, the many or the few. God is attentive to us. Who is God that, that when we have need, he says he inclines his ear towards us. He, he wants to hear our voice. We have the attention of God Almighty. The creator of the universe. He, he doesn't sit on a throne distant from us, but no, he loves to draw near to us. We have his attention. We have the affection of the Lord. And I love this in, in Zephaniah uh, 3, verse 17. He says that he rejoices over us with singing. We have the attention, Lord, we have the affection. It says in Psalms that he delights in you. You have a Father in heaven that is crazy about you. And I know when we think about these desires, man, there might be people in this room where they didn't have, you didn't have the attention of your, your father or your mother. You didn't have, you didn't grow up in a home where, where affection was well displayed. The Father is crazy about you. 
He's not annoyed by our problem. He actually, again, as we said over and over in Isaiah, he invites us to come near. We desire affirmation of the Father. He blesses us. We are his children, and he blesses us. He affirms who we are, he created us, he gave us our desires, our quirkiness, our, our talents, he gave it all to us, and he affirms it, and he blesses us, and he says, go use it for my kingdom. He involves us in what he's doing around the world. He, if you want to think about acceptance, how does God meet our desire for acceptance? He says to come to Him, no matter who we are, without money, uh, without uh, buying anything, without purchasing. He says, come to me. I accept you. And in Romans, it expands that thought even more to, think, uh, to, to say that while we were yet filthy rags, while we were nothing, while we were sinners, while we were far off from Him, He chose love. You. He came and, and gave himself for you. We're thinking this morning about satisfaction. I long for fulfilled for fullness. I, I, I long to be satisfied. Hey, Jesus himself, he sits, he, he goes to the cross, he, he he lays down his life for us. He, he rises again to life. And then he says, with all authority in heaven and on earth, I send you. Go. Make disciples. There's no greater mission. There's no greater calling. There's no greater longing to be involved with God and in and, and reconciling the world and bringing brightness around the world. We long for significance. God says, you can go and speak for me. In Jesus, we can find satisfaction for our every desire. Allow these truths to penetrate your heart and to believe on them. It says also in, in John that whoever believes on these things, right? Whoever believes on these things will have water. Whoever believes on these and receives these words will have bread. The last point that I make that I look at Isaiah chapter 55. It's this question of when can I be satisfied? Is the calling as a believer to be an eternal want and wait for a future hope that is to come? Isaiah 55 verse 6 says this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. When can we be satisfied? I would propose to you now. Now is the time to be satisfied. Now is the time to come to the Lord, and, and, and as it instructs us even here, turn, uh, turn or forsake our, our wicked ways, our, our ways that are unlike God. Turn uh, and forsake those ways that we have met our desires outside of who God is and, and what He's done. Turn from them, and He will or may have compassion on you. Turn so that he may have compassion on you and pardon you of all unrighteousness. 
forgive you of anything that doesn't look like you. This morning, it, 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 as much as it's a message of conviction, maybe that, that God would reveal some things about ourselves to us, it's also a message of hope that there's an invitation to come and to receive pardon and to receive forgiveness this morning, to receive satisfaction in Him this morning. And that's my prayer for us as a church. Uh, my prayer has been, and, and it's, it was great, last night we got to meet in, in my office for prayer. On the first Saturday of every month we do that. Uh, but uh, we, we met and we prayed, and, and we're praying we're praying for uh, this word revival. We're praying for a turning to God. And that's my desire for us, and that's my prayer for us continually. That we would turn to God. That we would turn to Him and be satisfied by Him. We would search for ways, whatever it is. If we're, if we're if this morning you're here, I'm sure. I'm not sure how God will satisfy this desire. I know I'm going after this thing. I, I want to pray with you that the Holy Spirit will reveal that. And again, I want to say, my schedule is wide open. As your pastor, I want to meet with you. I want to walk with you. I want to walk this out because God desires for us to have freedom. Our, uh, he desires that we would be whole. He, he desires that we would be satisfied. And, and if you're here and you're like, I, I'm not sure what that would look like, come meet with me. We'll meet for coffee. I'll, I'll be in the office. We'll do whatever we can to help bring the truth of God to bear on your desires so that you can receive what He has for you. This morning we have an opportunity to respond. And I, I know there's food out there. It's, it's great. But I want to take a moment uh, this morning to respond to the Word of God. Isaiah chapter 5, I'll, I'll read those last two verses again, 6 and 7. It says, Seek the Lord while, you, while He may be found. Call upon Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man His thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that He may have compassion on him. And to pour and sorry, and to our God, for He will abundantly pardon. This morning we have two opportunities. One is an opportunity to say, "Yes, Lord, I will follow You." If you're in this room this morning and you haven't made a decision to say, "Yes, Jesus, I want to follow You with my whole life," I want to encourage you in this moment. Take time to pray and say, "Jesus." I want to make you Lord of my life. I want to follow you with everything within me. But a second thing this morning, it is a prayer to reorder our desires. Say, Lord, pardon me. Lord, I want to be satisfied with you. Lord, feed my deepest desires that I may no longer thirst, that I may no longer be hungry. So let me take a moment to pray, and I want to encourage you to respond. If you need me to pray with you, I'll be here to pray with you. But we want to take a few moments to say, Lord, order our hearts, order our lives, that I may be satisfied in you. Let's pray this morning. Father, I'm grateful for your word. I, I am grateful for the invitation that you extend to us. You extend it to every individual here and every individual as far as the eye can see. You extend them an invitation to come and be satisfied. Come and drink. Come and receive. And so, Father, I thank you that you extend that invitation to us this morning. And I pray, Lord, that we would respond to you rightly this morning to receive from you forgiveness and wholeness. In Jesus' name, amen.